Welcome everyone. So this week we are going to talk about the basics of bylaws and hearings. Uh, clearly bylaws and hearings could take up a two or a three hour session, but it's under important to understand the basics of how bylaws and rules are enforced and the process of how hearings interact in those procedures. This week's sponsor is Dorset Realty um, in Metro Vancouver, and so thanks very much to them for their sponsorship of the webinar. And just a reminder, this is a pilot project that we are running. Um, we're trying to consolidate the basics of strata living into eight an eight part education series, um, ideal for new strata council members, owners, property managers, um, and make them eventually a targeted program that you'll be able to go back and revisit anytime at your convenience. <clears throat> Daryl is online and is going to monitor the quick the chat if you have any questions. And we have a few advanced questions already that I will address as we go through the presentation. You are muted. Everyone is muted. It's a webinar and your cameras are off. So um, you have no worries about us seeing past the door into your into your homes or your offices. Uh, so let's just go launch right in. Um, why do we have bylaws? Um, Section 9, 119 of the Strata Property Act um, requires a strata corporation to have bylaws. This is how you formulate the governance of your property. Um, you must have bylaws. They may provide for control, management, maintenance, use enjoyment of strata lots, common property, and the assets of the corporation, and most important, the administration of the corporation. So this will include a number of matters that you additionally may limit, prohibit, or restrict. Um, and so it might be short-term accommodations. They may be age restrictions. They may be pet restrictions. Might be the number of occupants in a unit. It may be matters that deal with your agenda or your annual meetings, um, operations, financial management. So there's a, a broad variety of conditions that occur. Bylaws give us the standards for the community in that, that we live in. And so they're different within every community. And likewise, they're different because every building is different. They can be used to address issues to prevent future disputes and problems. So normally when we look at a set of bylaws and we see an unusual bylaw, it's an indication of a problem that a community has had to address. Bylaws always should reflect the unique needs of your community, not another strata corporation. I frequently will come across bylaws from another strata corporation that a new strata has just simply adopted without looking closely at the implications and frequently they're either unenforceable or they simply don't apply to that community. And, and lastly, the bylaws provide the authority for your strata corporation to operate and to regulate its activities. The bylaws of every strata corporation in British Columbia, this includes duplexes all the way up to 12 and 1300 unit communities and bare land stratas are the standard bylaws in the Strata Property Act, except to the extent that your strata has not filed other bylaws in the land title office. <clears throat> An example of that might be how you conduct council meetings, or the order of your agenda, or the number of pets that we have, or the obligation to repair and maintain something. These are bylaws that are common for owners within the strata corporation and for it applies to tenants and occupants. Um, you can change your bylaws, you can repeal them, you can replace them, you can add to them as long as you're, you're complying with all of the requirements um, of the Strata Property Act. Here's some of the limitations. A bylaw is not enforceable to the extent that it contravenes this act, the Strata Property Act, the regulations of the Strata Property Act, the Human Rights Code, or any other enactment or law. So your bylaws have to comply with all municipal laws, provincial laws, federal laws, and any covenants or easements that have been filed on your property. A bylaw by cannot destroy or modify an easement created under Section 69 of the Act. And this is the right or the provision of the corporation to be able to, um, uh, to manage the responsibility of all of the pipes, wires, ducts, and cables that are common property that run between surroundings. 
um, bylaws also can't prohibit the right of or restrict the right of an owner to, to freely sell, lease, mortgage, or otherwise dispose of a strata lot or an interest in a strata lot. Some strata corporations own strata lots and individual owners, of course, own their own strata lots. So you can't adopt bylaws that hinder the ability to sell or to market property. There are some exceptions and some reasonable limitations to that, however. Here are the exceptions. You can have a bylaw that prohibits short-term accommodations. You can adopt a bylaw that relates to the sale of a strata lot. So the strata may limit or control signage and activities such as open houses. And you can have a bylaw that restricts the age of persons who reside in the strata lot. Essentially, age restriction bylaws of 55 and over are permitted. Bylaws have to comply with other enactments of law. And here's some examples for strata corporations. We have the, the provisions of the Human Rights Code, we have the Residential Tenancy Act, DC Employment Standards Act, Real Estate Services Act, and the Guide Dog Service and Service Animal Act. All of these are other forms of legislation that your bylaws must comply with. So for a sale of a strata lot, you can't unreasonably um, restrict the activities, but you can limit things such as posting of signs, times for showing of property or holding of open houses. Um, there could be reasonable windows and time periods for these um, to for the strata corporation to manage their own security or requirements. Bylaws and rules, here we are, um, strata corporations will frequently adopt a bylaw or a rule that makes owners responsible for the maintenance and repair of common property. And we see this all too often in townhouse complexes or where there are a multiple of duplexes as a townhouse complex where they will require owners to shovel their own sidewalks or do window washing on the exterior of the buildings or do their own landscaping or gutter cleaning. If the area is common property, you're not permitted to make an owner responsible for the maintenance and the repair of common property. So when we look at drafting of enforceable bylaws, we often do a little bit of a checklist and a step back. We ask ourselves some simple questions. Do we have a problem that we have to address? Um, common example, Strata Corporation has permitted barbecues on decks and balconies, but it's a wood frame building. We now have a problem because we've had damage to a unit or we have chronic complaints because of smoke um, um, that's penetrating other units. It might be time that the Strata adopts a bylaw that simply prohibits the use of barbecues or cooking on decks and balconies. Does the bylaw require or prohibit an activity? Again, barbecue might be a sufficient thing, but it could be something like smoking. Strata corporations can adopt bylaws to prohibit the smoking of any substance on any property or on common property, but it can also include strata lots. Who does the bylaw apply to? It applies to everyone, owners, visitors, spouses, um, tenants, everyone um, has the same effect of bylaws. Does it have an effect? It's a good question to always ask yourself when you're adopting a new bylaw. Will this bylaw unreasonably hinder our ability to market or sell our units? And then of course, always go back to the condition of, are there any types of human rights code infringements on bylaws that we are going to adopt? Then you take a step back and you say, okay, we've adopted this bylaw. Can it be enforced? Um, do we have clear language? Is it ambiguous? Is it a series of bylaws that contradict each other? Commonly, we will encounter where a strata corporation has required an owner to maintain and repair um, limited common property. The problem is they forget to amend the section about what the strata corporation's responsibility to maintain and repair limited common property. And now we have two bylaws the obligation of the strata corporation and the owner that are opposing each other. Um, you might look at things like bylaws that relate to waste and recycling. Um, they're very difficult to enforce, but they can be there as an, as a, um, an essential um, gatekeeper to address issues. 
age and pet bylaws do not apply to person or persons or pets in residence at the time the bylaw is passed. So these, these are what we would call conditional exemptions. The pet is in the building, the strata's adopted a bylaw that now limits to one cat or one dog, or maybe just one cat, um, and, the, and one owner has three dogs. Those three dogs at the time the bylaw is passed are exempt from the limitation bylaw. When those pets are no longer in residence, um, then the bylaw comes into effect um, for that strata lot and for those owners. You need to be looking closely at your bylaws when you make adopt a new bylaw. If you include a resolution that repeals previous bylaws, you might be repealing bylaws you had not intended to repeal, such as a pet bylaw or an age bylaw, and you could be granting exemptions all over again. And so, you know, um, uh, it's the greatest impact on rentals such as short-term accommodations age pet, pet and sections bylaws. You need to be very careful if you're repealing bylaws, what the implication is going to be. Um, a resolution that's adopted for the bylaw is just as critical as the bylaws. So we spoke a little while ago about preparing notice packages. One of the notice package items is the resolution to adopt bylaws. You need both. You need the resolution that essentially says what's happening with this bylaw and you need the bylaws. And the resolution clearly has to indicate if the bylaw is an amendment or if it's being repealed or if a new bylaw is being adopted. You must file your bylaws in the land title registry to be enforceable. There used to be a 60 day window of requirement, but that no longer applies. And then finally, to act to um, um, make sure that you have adopted the bylaw correctly, also file the past resolution. So on the form I, when you complete it, make sure you have filed the past resolution. In mixed use property, a bylaws that apply to both residential and non-residential in a strata corporation must be ratified by three quarters vote separately by both the residential owners present in person or proxy and the non-residential owners. The best way to ensure that you've done this correctly, publish separately um, resolutions for both the residential and the non-residential units in the notice package. You will require two separate three quarters votes. And even if only one person from the commercial section shows up, if they vote in favor, that would constitute a three quarters vote for their section. Um, and show in the minutes the results of each separate vote. If either of the votes does not pass or nobody shows up for the commercial section, the resolution does not pass. Um, and that's one of the greatest um, complaints of most strata corporations is that no one from the commercial or non-residential owners will attend. And essentially they would not have ratified the bylaw itself. It's the greatest challenge most strata corporations um, have. Register both resolutions with the form I as well, both residential and the non-residential. Um, it helps you ensure that your bylaws are challenged in the, in the future. When, we, when we're drafting bylaws, we always have to uh, make sure that we've complied with the Human Rights Code. Um, again, this is where we strongly recommend legal services. Um, bylaws are not just simply about um, you know, stopping somebody from putting uh, dragging their bicycles through the lobby it would be a good example. Um, it gets much more involved than that because now it involves um, dollars. It involves if you have improperly enforced past or applied bylaws, it involves potential insurance claims. It involves challenges in the civil resolution tribunal um, and can have a significant number of impacts on your community. Um, and bylaws that deal with privacy, short-term accommodations, age restrictions, insurance and damages, business operations or alterations. All of these are bylaws that I strongly recommend you have legal advice on. Um, here's a sequence that we use frequently. A new set of bylaws is adopted, is proposed. So we look at the first existing bylaws to see if anything needs to be repealed or amended. Consult with your owners. One of the great benefits of Zoom is that it's easy to have information meetings with owners. They're quick. You can get a lot of information from the owners, a lot of feedback, doesn't require notice, and it will really help to move things along quickly for your community. Engage a lawyer to review your final draft of proposed bylaws at the very least. 
um, before they go out with notice. Um, the, you can't adopt and pass a bylaw and then somebody says, hey, look, we discovered an error. You can't fix that error without another meeting. So, you know, a little bit of insurance to make sure that you haven't really lost your ability um, to file enforceable bylaws is there. Issue the notice of general meeting, include with the notice both the exact wording of the proposed bylaws and the resolution. You vote on the proposed amendments um, by voting on the resolution. You calculate and record the votes in the minutes. Bylaw amendments are not one that I would just simply declare have been passed. I would always take a precise count. Calculate and record the votes in the minutes. If they're passed, register them in the land title form. Do it within seven days. Past seven days, someone will forget. And as we've historically seen now, um, it's going to come up that we're going to try enforcing a bylaw that nobody ever filed, which is a problem. And then, of course, always inform the owners and the tenants. Bylaw enforcement. Section 129, Section 135. Um, to 135. Here are the provisions of the Act, I think, that are most valuable. Um, this, this needs to be taken with a very simplistic approach. Otherwise, we tend to miss out on the enforcement requirements. If you want to enforce a bylaw or a rule, you can do one of the following. You can impose a fine under the Act. You can remedy a contravention, which could be the removal of um, uh, of a component that is sitting on common property not permitted there, or under the rules, you can deny access to a recreational facility. Before you enforce a bylaw though, you can always provide a warning to people. Bylaws are not about penalties and collecting money. They're about correcting behavior. And in most cases, um, a, a kind, gentle letter or a notice collectively to everybody can be more than sufficient to ensure that everybody has um, the ability to comply with the bylaws. And then of course, if a bylaw is not enforced properly, um, a tenant or an owner can file a complaint with the CRT. It becomes very dodgy when you're not enforcing bylaws correctly. Follow the procedures of section 135 in their logical sequence set out in the act. The strata corporation must not impose a fine against a person, require a person to the cost of remedying um, a contravention, or deny a person the use of a recreational facility, unless you have done the following. So here's what the conditions are. You have to re first receive a complaint about the contravention. That complaint could also be a complaint that was filed by the strata council. So it doesn't necessarily have to come from an owner. It can be the council who complained, but you have to be very careful that this is not the council acting as the strata police who are going around and trying to look for bylaw violations. As a council member, you may be the person who is aware of the violation and it, and it can be simply a matter of remedying it, you would be part of the particulars of the complaint in writing. And indeed, as the treasurer, if somebody's um, late in paying their strata fees, technically speaking, it's the treasurer who files the complaint. The owner and tenant have a reasonable opportunity to answer the complaint, including a hearing if they've requested it. And if the person is a tenant, give a notice of the complaint to the person's landlord and to the owner. So, you know, you have this ability to um, give a, a reasonable complaint and to be able to deal with the, um, the owner or the tenant. Um, you, the strata corporation can fine an owner if the bylaw or the rule is contravened. You can also fine a tenant, but ultimately the owner um, can be responsible for penalties if the tenant has complied. Um, and this is if a bylaw or rule is con convened, contravened by the owner, person who's visiting, for any social, business, or family reasons, an occupant, and if the strata lot is rented out um, by the owner to a tenant. So you have a variety of responsibilities. The strata corporation may file a tenant, find a tenant if a bylaw or rule is contravened by the tenant um, and who is a person who is visiting the tenant. Um, 
or if the strata lot is sublet by the tenant, both for the tenant and the owner of the strata lot. So the person who committed the violation, ultimately the responsibility falls to the owner and the tenant. Tenants can be fined. Some tenants will voluntarily comply and pay. Others may not. If the strata corporation finds a tenant or you require a tenant to pay costs for remedying a contravention, then you can collect the fine from the tenant, from the tenant's landlord, or from the owner. Um, the act itself actually differentiates and specifies both the landlord or the owner, because we may have an agent who is acting on behalf of or representing the parties. Here are the maximum fines. The standard bylaws for, a, under the standard bylaws of the act, a bylaw is $50, a rule is $10. You can amend your bylaws, and many strata corporations have, so the violation of a bylaw may be $200 or a rule up to $50, and for short-term accommodations, it may be as high as $1,000, which can be imposed for each day of violations. If the bylaws permit a strata corporation to impose a fine um, also for a continuing contravention of every seven days. So we have two types of contraventions. We have a continuing contravention, and this is one where a condition is not changed. The bylaw prohibits more than one dog. Someone has taken in two dogs, um, and they continue to have two dogs. We send them notice, um, and they refuse to comply every seven days for a reasonably a reasonable period of time. We can impose a fine of two hundred dollars. The difference between that and a serial violation is the serial violation could be somebody who is abusing visitor parking or somebody who is having parties every night. So if they have, um, if they're abusing visitor parking, um, this ends up being an issue with respect to every time they park there, then they will have an issue where they were subject to a potential fine. Same thing with the party. There's a party Monday night, there's a party Wednesday night, and there's a party on Friday night. Each time you have one of these events, what occurs is that um, they will be receiving notice of the violation. Um, so when you're amending your fines or applying fines, you have to ask yourself, consider the penalty and is it proportional to the violation, right? So if any of you um, are Gilbert and Sullivan fans, um, you'll always ask yourself, does the punishment fit the crime? And that's really what you want to evaluate or assess because that will fall under scrutiny with respect to a dispute in the tribunal. A bylaw is gonna set out, for example, a maximum number of pets. An owner has two cats. A complaint is filed. The council gives notice. The owner argues in hearing that it's still just two pets and her two cats are indoors and there's no complaints about noise or control. Council's obligation is to enforce the bylaws. But ask yourself the question, is $200 a week for six months totaling $2,600 a reasonable enforcement of the, of the bylaw? Um, it, you're expected as a strata corporation to enforce the bylaw. What you're not expected or permitted to do is use this as a money generating opportunity. You know, in most cases within 30 or 60 days, if someone is not complying with the bylaws, your next step is a strata council. Give them notice of um, an application to the CRT that you're going to make an application to the CRT. Go to the tribunal and get an order, the fines for the first month or two, and an order for them to comply with the bylaws of the corporation. Pet bylaws are quite a common dispute. Um, the owner, um, in this case of the pet bylaw, requested a hearing to challenge the fines imposed by the strata. So again, before you get into hearings, and we're going to talk about those in a moment, but before you get into hearings, you always want to evaluate a few things and always double check. It's surprising how frequently someone missed out a step. Did we pass this bylaw correctly? Was it filed in the land title registry? Have we enforced it in the same way for everyone? And did we follow the proper enforcement procedures under Section 135 of the Act? Um, before you go down the road of a hearing, you really want to verify what you have. So what is a hearing? Well, simply, as, as, it, as it states, it's an opportunity for owners and tenants to be heard in person regarding a matter. 
it's an opportunity for the council who have to make a decision to gather information. And it's an opportunity for council to ask questions or to request additional information before a decision can be made. So council are not giving any specific feedback during a hearing, but they may ask questions, they may gather more information. A hearing occurs at a properly convened strata council meeting. It's not a casual meeting of two council members and the person who wants a hearing or the property manager and a council member and the person. This is a properly convened council meeting. And the act sets out specific requirements for the holding of the hearing and the delivery of the decision. Here's a, 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 a decision out of the BC Court of Appeal. Um, and, and it's a very nice um, interpretation of a hearing. But the rationale for affording a person an opportunity to be heard is the idea that people will listen with an open mind to that which is said and reach a considered decision. It's kind of difficult sometimes to be have an open mind when you get into an embroiled dispute with an owner. But if you take a moment and step back, it will make quite a significant difference. There's two specific references in the act that relate to hearings. The first is any owner, any tenant can demand a hearing on a specific matter. They submit the request in writing and they have to identify what the particulars um, or what the reason they're requesting the hearing. Bylaw and rule enforcement is also a hearing request. Um, so the hearing can occur for a variety of reasons. Alteration to a strata lot, application for special accommodation of an alteration, um, uh, a special accommodation of a pet with a pet restriction bylaw, dispute over the validity of claims to a notice of bylaw violations, charges that relate to a strata lot for insurance deductible or damages, failure for a strata corporation to maintain and repair. Um, when we're setting up a hearing, consider how the hearing is going to run. Location is important. And, and this can also be electronically. It does not have to be an in-person hearing situation. What you want to do is facilitate an environment where the person who's requesting to be heard and the council members are comfortable and they're capable of hearing each other and having a dialogue. Um, so look at timing and convenience. Um, you may do an electronic hearing. You may do it in person. It might You might have a scheduled time at the beginning of your council meetings if there's any hearings or at the end. Things to consider. How can you ensure it's a fair and a comfortable process? Um, you want this to be fair and balanced because if it's not, it will look badly when it ends up becoming a dispute in the future. Is everyone in your council on a non-conflict position? Worst case scenario is that there are several strata council members who are committing the same violations, but they're involved as council members with the hearings. Remember the same conditions apply to everyone. Don't treat individuals as different classes of persons. If a council member has a direct or indirect interest in the matter, make sure they're not part of the hearing. Make sure they're away from it and it's a fair decision. Um, and of course, we need to ask ourselves, is there a potential conflict of interest for a council member? Um, I, I kind of go by the old rule of thumb for conflict of interest. If some things come up and you have to ask yourself, I wonder if this might be a conflict of interest, it probably is a conflict of interest. Um, and then, of course, look at what direct or indirect interest in a matter might be. Somebody may have requested a hearing about a contract that was issued by the Strata Corporation because they've discovered the contractor is a relative of one of the council members or a business interest of one of the council members, and it was never dis disclosed to the owners. Those are direct or indirect interests in the outcome. So who participates in a hearing? So the person who requested or demanded the hearing is obvious. The Strata Council, your property manager may be present. You might have a facilitator present. Other people who are material to the hearing, there could be witnesses. Um, and of course, people who are agreed both by the person requesting, the requester and the strata council and legal representation. Um, telling your strata council or telling your owner who's requested the hearing, they're not entitled to bring legal representation um, is already going to prejudice the hearing process against them. You're not as a strata council permitted to delegate the enforcement of bylaws. 
or matters of personal nature or hardship exemptions or, intro or matters that arise. So conditions that might require a decision under the human rights code, um, an alteration under the human rights code, accommodation of some capacity, um, the enforcement of bylaws. Your council cannot delegate this to the property manager or to a single council member. These are decisions of council by the majority vote, and it's council that has to render the decision following the hearing. The bylaws, standard bylaws of the Act do not contemplate that the hearing or a council meeting will be chaired by someone other than, the, than an elected council member chairing the council meeting. The president, the vice president, or if they are unavailable, it would be fall to another council member. The person who's requested the hearing delivers specific information evidence or request to the strata council regarding a specific agenda item, a bylaw or a claim, cost or a dispute. The council who convenes the hearing is the purpose of gathering the information. And then the decisions regarding the, he the hearing matter are to be made by council following the completion of the hearing. And the completion of the hearing, I would not say let's defer this to next week because you have a short time period within one week after the hearing you must make a decision and you must send, give the applicant a written decision of what your of what the outcome of your meeting and your hearing was. And again, think about the timing of this. You must have the hearing within four weeks after the request is received, and you must provide a written decision of the hearing within one week after um, the council meeting or the meeting hearing was conducted. Here's section 135, I, and I've, I've reintroduced it into the act because I think it's important um, with respects to this presentation. Um, and let's reframe it. It says the strata council must not. What I would like to say is before the strata corporation enforces a bylaw or imposes any penalties, you must first send um, uh, receive a note about uh, a, a complaint about the con contravention. Then you have to give the owner or the tenant who the complaints have been made the particulars of this complaint in writing and a reasonable opportunity to answer the complaint. And if it's a tenant, you must also send the notice to the owner or the landlord of the unit. So it's so it's important that everybody receives. Um, fair notice. It's important everyone has fair opportunity to respond in writing a request for hearing, and it's important that the opportunity for a hearing is actually conducted. Um, a letter sent to an owner must not predetermine or prejudge the infraction. The letter may say, we've received a complaint about the following conditions, um, and the um, um, and you are uh, um, entitled to respond in writing or to request a hearing. So we've received a complaint that you have been having, um, that you have two dogs in your unit. Only one dog is permitted under bylaw, whichever number it is. Um, before the strata um, can proceed, you're entitled to a hearing or to respond to this complaint in writing. Then you leave it up to here. Um, you don't want to think, say things like, um, the council are finding you in violation of the bylaws. Um, these are just simply allegations at this point, allegations which can be disputed by anyone, any owner or tenant at any time. Um, um, oftentimes the question comes up, if a person is requesting a hearing, wants to bring a witness. Um, and, and people, you have to understand that individuals might feel really quite intimidated by council members. Council members can be very aggressive sometimes and even bullying. Um, and having a witness or another person there can make the process much fairer. Um, and it ensures that the person has not been intimidated or prejudiced in some way that is unfair to them. Some simple do's and don'ts when you're dealing with hearings. Um, always have an open mind and a willingness to, to listen. Explain the process and how the hearing is going to proceed. Ask questions such as details that you need for clarity. 
respond to the applicant within the seven days. Don't delay that. Um, re um, don't restrict the time period for a hearing either. This is another important issue. Um, if you restrict the time period for a hearing, you're going to potentially prejudice this person to a fair process. And don't enter the hearing with a preconceived notion of what the out the outcome should be. There's no such thing as a typical hearing. Every circumstance in every hearing is unique. Another thing to remember is that you need to be putting your decision of your council in the minutes of the applicable council meeting. So, um, you know, there, we do have a decision um, uh, in, from Strata Plan 1902 um, where there was a lack of a decision um, within the minutes. And so, um, um, you know, you, it's important um, that you actually get um, your decision out of council um, and it's a majority vote decision of the Strata Corporation. Uh, a, a council, um, a hearing is a council meeting. It's properly convened. It's a majority vote of council. And remember, a majority vote of council is different than a majority vote at a general meeting. It's a majority of those council members who are in attendance. So nobody's voting opposed or against, but they do need to um, uh, participate. If seven council members show up, Four council members have to vote in favor for a decision to be made. And decisions need to be made by a majority of council members. And so that's where we get to the end in about 36 minutes, Daryl. I've lost Daryl. Questions? Yeah, so you here? Can you hear me? I think I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, we do have some. So right from the top, we had that emailed one that came in. If council's aware of bylaw infractions, uh, even without a complaint, are they required to deal with it? What happens if they don't? Well, there's, it's, a, it's this fine line, right? Like, are you acting as the strata police? Uh, and, a, you know, a great example of that recently is a strata corporation where they have designated positions. And one position is the bylaw officer. Don't do that. Um, that's not how this works. Nobody goes around looking for bylaw violations and nobody has tickets or, or any type of citations that they actually put out um, and that they give to people. Um, you know, it's the same form letter, a notice of complaint. We have a sample of it on the website. The same form letter is sent to everyone. Um, so, you know, if council are aware that there is a violation, um, it could be that the council themselves have filed the complaint. Here's a good example. Um, townhouse complex, everybody has um, um, uh, carports. And the bylaws clearly say boats must not be stored in carport areas. One owner has parked their boat on their trailer in their carport, and their car is now parked in their driveway. Um, this could be temporary. It could be an overnight situation, in which case it's not that significant. But um, if a council member is aware of it and they see it, it's anybody could have seen this. This, this could be a legitimate bylaw complaint. So I, th I think, again, you have to act reasonably, but by no means is the strata council going to be the um, the strata police um, or the bylaw enforcement um, posse that's going to be going after everybody for every little violation. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, so we had uh, someone say that they joined to participate in the management of their corporation, but find that uh, calls and messages uh, seem to be coming in, uh, asking them for to deal with some infraction or deal with uh, trying to catch people when something's in progress. How do we deal with that as council members? Um, well, that's a little sketchy, mm -hmm. um, but 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 it seems to me that what that is is an invitation for council members to actively monitor bylaw violations. Yeah, that's I think that's mean, what they meant. I think that's what that is. Um, again, stay away from that. You know, yeah. like um, you know, I think I think if bylaw enforcement is casual, I, you know, look at I look at my building, thirteen years old, mm -hmm. I I two hundred and fifty units. I think we've sent out five bylaw enforcement letters over the years because generally most things that end up becoming issues are often easily addressed with a casual phone call um, mm. uh, to remind somebody. 
um, or just a reminder that gets sent out to everybody about what the conditions are. We're coming up to Christmas. Uh, if you have a bylaw that prohibits Christmas trees, before people start getting Christmas trees and dragging them through the building, you know, send out a notice to everyone about this time of year, reminding them what the protocol is for Christmas trees and for wreaths and things like this. Owners don't have a copy of their bylaws and tenants sitting on their counter that they read. They never do. Um, they, they basically function with normal behavior, hoping that they've not really crossed a bylaw or anything. But, you know, I think you need to, again, look really closely. Um, routine informing of your owners of what your key bylaws are will go a long way to stopping bylaw enforcement issues. Super. Um, the This townhouse and apartment sort of mixed uh, strata has split council bylaws. What happens if we don't get enough, say, townhouse owners? Um, can we fill those vacancies with people from the apartments, for example? Like, you know, those you've seen those bylaws, I'm sure, where they'll have three townhouse owners and four apartment owners on council, elected to council. You know, unless the Strata Corporation has also created sections, I really don't think those bylaws are enforceable. Because the problem is it by it contradicts the provisions of the act that matters are decided by a majority vote, and it contradicts the eligibility of council members as stipulated in the act. And so the difficulty with that is you're basically preventing um, uh, vacancies from being filled because there's simply no one available to um, serve on council. And if the bylaw says a minimum three or a maximum of seven, then it's a minimum three of maximum of seven. And those are more courteous bylaws to try and get a balance of people on their strata councils. But if nobody in the townhouse complexes wants to be um, on council, um, then you're going to want to have more people from the apartments because the difficulty is there's not enough people to do the work. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Um, CRT has dismissed fines due to incorrect process under Section 135. Can the fines be reinstated for the same issue if correct process is followed? So can they redo this entire process? Well, they could if the if the complaints occurred again right but you can't go back can't go retroact this and reinvent this and reapply it the the if the crt has dismissed the fines the fines are dismissed dismissed um right you don't get to you don't get to reinvent how you um aired in the first place so that you can still charge people fines that being said um the other side of this is finding excessively um, you know, Strata Corporation, who mounted up $21,000 of fines for violating pet bylaws, to find, to discover that um, $20,000 worth was dismissed. Um, it's not about collecting money or generating revenues. It's about, um, it, it's about remedying behavior. So, you know, after a month or two, if, if the behavior is not remedied, and it might be even sooner if, if the violation that's, that's being committed is placing the corporation at risk, um, you, you know, um, you may find that what's going to ultimately happen is the corporation is going to have to get into CRT immediately to get an order for compliance, or maybe even go to Supreme Court. It might be that much more egregious for everybody involved. Great. Um what happens if you lose quorum of counsel due to a conflict of interest when, when dealing with an issue? The minutes need to reflect who was present. So the quorum of counsel would change then because the conflict of interest itself would diminish the number of council members that are available for the meeting. So seven council members, but there's a conflict um, and, and a quorum is four. Only five people show up but two people have a conflict because they've been involved in this dispute and they have to leave the meeting. Let the minutes show that they left the meeting and the remaining three council members made a decision. Super. Um, uh, I think that's probably gonna take care of most of us stuff. Anything that we didn't get to, we can, we can get owners or people that were present to send us an email. I was gonna say the other thing about bylaw enforcement is it's absolutely essential to gather evidence. So, you know, and no more prevalent are we seeing this is in um, short-term accommodation violations. So if you're on a website and the unit comes up being available for short-term accommodations, 
um, make sure you print off these documents. Keep records of the documents because when the unit gets rented out for short-term accommodations, if you have a bylaw that prohibits them, you're going to need evidence. And evidence can be a variety of circumstances and conditions. Um, we didn't talk about privacy at all during this. That's a whole other realm of discussion that we will set up a separate condition for. Um, but strata corporations are unlawfully using surveillance information for bylaw enforcement. Um, if you conduct any surveillance, whether it's through cameras or fobs or any kind of recording devices, you must have a bylaw that permits you to conduct surveillance, how it's managed, what the information is used for, where it's stored, how long it's stored, who can see it, how it's disposed. Um, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner has a very good guide. And within the guide, there's a checklist that essentially tells you what your bylaw should have if you're going to conduct surveillance. Um, but if, you're, if you intend on using video surveillance for the purpose of enforcing bylaws, you're going to have some real challenges. Don't do it if you can avoid it. Super. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everyone. Um, very much a pleasure. And um, if ho hopefully we'll see everybody again soon. And once again, if you have questions, we're always open to emails. Again, these are the basics. We could certainly go in depth in a variety of ways. Um, but at this time, it's just a great start for us. So thanks, everyone, for joining today. And we will see you all very soon.